The epic saga of the interstellar comet known as 3I Atlas is nearing its end, but not before it goes out without a metaphorical bang. The comet just made its closest pass by Earth. 3I Atlas is releasing hydrogen cyanide into space. And if you don't know what that is, it's the same deadly gas that was used as a chemical weapon in World War I. And this interstellar object just made its closest approach to Earth on December 19th, which means it's as close as it's ever going to get. And it's actively shedding toxic material as it moves through the solar system. And scientists just measured exactly how much material is coming off this thing and where it's going and what they found raises some pretty serious questions about what could actually reach Earth and what that means for us. So let's start with what 3i Atlas is releasing and why there's poison gas from another star system floating around out there right now. What 3i slash Atlas is releasing. So let's talk about hydrogen cyanide because this is not some abstract chemical compound. This is one of the most notorious toxic substances in modern history and it's currently being released by 3i Atlas as it passes through the inner solar system. Hydrogen cyanide was first weaponized during World War I, and it was used by the French military as a chemical weapon against enemy troops, and the gas works by disrupting the body's ability to use oxygen, and it causes rapid respiratory failure and death within minutes of exposure. And we're talking about one of the most lethal substances ever deployed in warfare. And this is what 3i Atlas is actively releasing into space right now. Now, before we go any further, let me be clear about something, because I don't want to create unnecessary panic here. The hydrogen cyanide coming from 3i Atlas is not some engineered weapon, and it's not being released intentionally, and there's no sinister alien plot to poison the Earth or anything like that. This is a natural chemical compound that exists in comets, and it forms when carbon and nitrogen and hydrogen combine in the frozen environment of the outer solar system, or in this case, in whatever distant star system 3i Atlas came from billions of years ago. But the fact that it's naturally occurring doesn't make it any less toxic, and it doesn't change the fact that this interstellar visitor is surrounded by a cloud of poison gas that would be instantly lethal to any human who came into direct contact with it. And hydrogen cyanide isn't the only thing coming off 3i Atlas. Observations from the James Webb Space Telescope and other instruments have confirmed that the coma surrounding this object contains a whole cocktail of compounds, including carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, and water vapor, and various other organic molecules and metals like nickel. So we're looking at a complex mixture of materials being actively shed from the surface of this ancient object as it heats up near the sun and the amount of material being released is significant. Scientists have measured the mass loss rate coming from 3i Atlas, and it's substantial enough that the solar wind is actively stripping away the gas cloud and creating that characteristic fuzzy halo and tail structure that we associate with comets. And this is happening continuously, as long as 3i Atlas is close enough to the sun to sublimate its frozen surface materials. So you've got this interstellar object that's between 7 and 14 billion years old traveling through our solar system at 148,600 miles per hour. And it's actively shedding toxic gas and dust and various compounds into the space around it. And on December the 19th, it came closer to Earth than it ever will again at a distance of about 269 million kilometers. And that raises the obvious question that a lot of people have been asking. Can any of this material actually reach Earth? Why scientists say the gas can't reach us? And here's what scientists figured out when they ran the calculations on whether the hydrogen cyanide and other gases from 3i Atlas could drift toward Earth and potentially enter our atmosphere. The answer, according to the data from the James Webb Space Telescope, is no. And here's why. The key factor is something called the solar wind, which is just a constant stream of charged particles flowing out from the sun in all directions at speeds of hundreds of kilometers per second. And this solar wind acts like a cosmic pressure washer that strips away any loose gas or lightweight material that's floating around in the inner solar system. And when you measure the mass loss rate from 3i Atlas, which Webb did very precisely, 
you can calculate how far that gas travels before it gets completely dispersed and blown away by the solar wind and the stopping distance for the gaseous material coming from 3i Atlas is only a few million kilometers from the object itself. Let me put that in perspective. The closest approach distance between 3i Atlas and Earth's orbit was about 269 million kilometers, and even at the absolute closest point, the comet's trajectory brought it to within about 55 million kilometers of where Earth's orbital path is. And the gas from 3i Atlas gets stripped away and dispersed within just a few million kilometers of the nucleus, which means there's no way for that hydrogen cyanide or any other toxic gas to migrate anywhere near Earth's orbital distance. The Sun is essentially acting like a giant vacuum cleaner that sucks up and disperses all of the lightweight gaseous material long before it could drift toward any of the inner planets. So, from a gas perspective, we're completely safe, and there's no scenario where hydrogen cyanide from 3i Atlas enters Earth's atmosphere or poses any threat to life on our planet. And that's good news, obviously, but here's where things get interesting, because gas isn't the only thing that 3i Atlas is releasing. The particles that could reach Earth. Because along with all that gas, there's also dust and solid particles being shed from the surface of 3i Atlas. And those particles behave very differently from gas molecules when it comes to solar wind and radiation pressure. The really tiny particles we're talking about micron scale stuff that's smaller than a grain of sand get pushed outward by solar radiation pressure, just like the gas does. And those particles move away from the sun and never come anywhere near Earth. But larger particles, and when I say larger, I'm talking about millimeter scale objects, which are still pretty small, but they're massive enough that solar radiation pressure doesn't affect them nearly as much. And those millimeter scale particles can actually continue along their original trajectory. And if that trajectory happens to intersect with Earth's orbital path, then yes, in theory, material from 3i Atlas could reach Earth. Now, before anyone panics, let me explain what would actually happen if a millimeter scale particle from 3i Atlas entered Earth's atmosphere. It would burn up completely in the upper atmosphere, just like every other meteoroid that hits Earth on a daily basis. And we're talking about tens of thousands of natural meteoroids burning up in our atmosphere every single day without causing any problems. So even if particles from 3i Atlas did reach us, they would pose zero threat at ground level. But, and this is where it gets genuinely interesting, those particles wouldn't necessarily burn up before we could study them. If you had a satellite or spacecraft positioned in the right location above Earth's atmosphere, you could potentially collect those particles for direct laboratory analysis, and that would be an unprecedented scientific achievement. Think about what that means. We would have actual physical samples of material from another star system that we could hold in our hands and examine under microscopes and analyze with every instrument we have. This would be the first time in human history that we've been able to study interstellar material directly without having to send a probe billions of miles away to collect it. And the scientific value of something like that is almost impossible to overstate. We could analyze the isotopic ratios to figure out what kind of star system 3i Atlas formed in, and we could study the mineral composition to understand what raw materials were available in that distant stellar environment, and we could examine any organic compounds to see if the chemistry of life exists beyond our solar system. We could even look for signatures of stellar nucleosynthesis that might tell us about supernovae or other cosmic events that occurred billions of years ago in a part of the galaxy we've never been able to study directly, and the window to do this is incredibly narrow. Scientists estimate that we have maybe a few weeks, or at most a couple of months, to design and deploy some kind of collection experiment before 3 I. Atlas gets too far away, and the flux of particles drops below detectable levels. After that, the opportunity is gone forever. The International Space Station already has the infrastructure and the altitude to potentially serve as a collection platform, and there are existing aerogel collectors that have been used for previous sample return missions that could theoretically be adapted for this purpose. So the technology exists and the platform exists, but what doesn't exist is the funding approval, or the mission timeline, or the political will to make it happen on such short notice. So you've got this race against time where researchers are trying to figure out if it's even feasible to put together a satellite mission 
or use existing platforms like the International Space Station to collect and return samples of 3i Atlas material, and the clock is ticking because every day that passes the comet moves farther away and the particle density decreases. But there's one more factor that complicates all of this, and it's the one thing that scientists keep coming back to when they talk about 3E Atlas, the assumption that everything depends on. Because all of these calculations about where the gas goes and where the particles go, and what can reach Earth and what can't, are based on one critical assumption, and that assumption is that the material being released from 3I Atlas behaves passively. What I mean by that is the math assumes that once gas molecules and dust particles leave the surface of the nucleus, they're governed entirely by gravity and solar radiation pressure and solar wind and nothing else. They can't steer themselves and they can't maneuver and they can't change direction on their own. They just follow the physics. And if that assumption is correct, then everything I just told you holds up and the gas can't reach Earth and the particles would burn up harmlessly and the only opportunity is to collect samples above the atmosphere and that's the end of the story. But if that assumption is wrong and if the material being released from 3i here, Atlas has any capability to maneuver or alter its trajectory, then all bets are off and we're looking at a completely different scenario. Now, I want to be very clear here because this is where things can sound like science fiction pretty quickly, but there is currently no evidence that 3i Atlas is artificial, and there is no evidence that any of the material it's releasing is technological or capable of maneuvering. NASA and the European Space Agency have both emphasized this point repeatedly. However, and this is important, 3i Atlas has exhibited some pretty unusual behaviors that don't fit neatly into our understanding of how normal comets work. We've talked about this in previous videos, but just to recap, the object has a persistent anti-tail that points toward the Sun instead of away from it, and it showed unusual non-gravitational acceleration during its perihelion, and it's way smaller than its brightness suggests it should be, and it released radio emissions that have never been detected from an interstellar comet before. And Harvard astrophysicist Avi Loeb has published multiple papers analyzing these anomalies, and while he's not saying definitively that 3i Atlas is artificial, he has pointed out that the object's behavior warrants closer scrutiny and that we shouldn't dismiss the possibility of technological origins just because it seems unlikely. So when scientists say that material from 3i Atlas can't reach Earth unless it can maneuver, what they're really saying is that based on our current understanding of physics and based on the assumption that everything is behaving naturally, the threat is zero. But if we're wrong about that assumption, then the equations change and so do the conclusions. And that brings us to the larger question that 3i Atlas forces us to confront, which is how do we know when we're looking at something natural versus something that might not be? And at what point do we take seriously the possibility that an interstellar visitor could be more than just a rock and ice? What happens next? And this is why the next few weeks and months are so critical, because we're running out of time to study 3i Atlas before it moves beyond our ability to observe it effectively. Right now, the object is fading rapidly as it moves farther from the Sun and farther from Earth, and it's already down to magnitude 13, which means you need a pretty serious telescope just to see it. And by the end of December, it'll be magnitude 14 or dimmer, and by January, it'll be effectively invisible to all but the largest professional observatories. The James Webb Space Telescope and other major instruments can still observe it for a little while longer, but that window is closing fast, and every day we lose a little more capability to gather data. And then we've got the March 16, 2026 Jupiter flyby, when 3 RC Atlas will pass within about 53.6 million kilometers of the giant planet and there's a possibility that NASA's Juno spacecraft, which is currently in orbit around Jupiter, could take some final images and measurements during that encounter. That would be our last really good look at this object before it heads out beyond Neptune and disappears back into interstellar space. After March 2026, it's over. 3i Atlas will be traveling at 148,600 miles per hour away from us, and it will never return and we will never get another chance to study it. 
So scientists are faced with this decision about whether to try and collect particle samples while they still can, and whether to design some kind of rapid response mission that could intercept the comet, or at least position collectors in the right locations to capture debris, and whether any of that is even feasible given the time and budget constraints, and the bureaucratic hurdles that come with trying to launch anything into space on an emergency timeline. And underlying all of that is this other question about whether 3i Atlas is just a really weird comet, or whether it represents something that challenges our basic assumptions about what interstellar objects can be. Because here's the thing about interstellar visitors, we've only confirmed three of them in all of human history. Oumuamua, in 2017 and Borisov in 2019, and now 3i Atlas in 2025. That's it, three objects, and two of them Oumuamua and 3i Atlas have exhibited behaviors that don't fit cleanly into our models. So we're not exactly working with a large sample size here, and we don't have a solid baseline for what normal interstellar objects are supposed to look like, and maybe that means we need to be more open to the possibility that some of these visitors are genuinely unusual, and not just unusual in a quirky, natural way, but unusual in a way that might require us to expand our understanding of what's possible. And whether we're talking about collecting toxic gas samples, or analyzing millimeter scale particles, or studying radio emissions, or trying to explain anti-tails that point the wrong way. All of these questions come back to this fundamental issue of how seriously we take the anomalies and whether we're willing to invest the resources to find out what we're actually looking at. Right now, 3i Atlas is out there moving away from us at incredible speed, and it's still releasing hydrogen, cyanide and dust and whatever else is locked up in its ancient frozen nucleus, and we've got a limited window to decide what we're going to do about it before that window closes forever. And the material from 3i Atlas probably can't reach Earth in any meaningful way. And even if it could, it probably wouldn't pose a threat. And even if it did pose a threat, we probably don't have anything to worry about, because the physics says it can't get here. But all of that depends on the word, probably, and on the assumption that we understand what we're looking at, and that nothing about this 7 to 14 billion year old visitor from another star system is going to surprise us. And given everything we've learned about 3i Atlas so far, I'm not sure that's an assumption we should be making. So here's my question for you. If scientists had the opportunity to collect physical samples of material from 3i Atlas, but it would cost hundreds of millions of dollars and require a rapid response mission that might not even work should they do it, or should we just let this interstellar visitor pass by and hope that the next one is easier to study? Let me know what you think in the comments, and if you want to stay updated on what happens with 3i Atlas over the next few months, including the December observations and the March Jupiter flyby, make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell, because this story is far from over. Thanks for watching.